Okay, good morning. Um, I would like to welcome you to this course. My name is Rudy Ebersold, and I have a research group here at ETH Zurich. Uh, we, our focus, research focus is on the proteome, and as you will see, then we have a whole number of very talented people in the group who actually organize this course. So these are the main course organizers here and also going to be your main instructors during the week. This is Ariel Ben-Simon. Where is Ariel? Not here. Tina Ludwig is the person over there. Ben Collins sitting in the back. Betty Friedrich is not here. And Olga Schubert, she's, um, she actually left the lab, but she was instrumental in setting up the course initially. Then we have a whole number of outside instructors who are coming in du during the week. So one key person is Brendan McLean, from his, uh, at, at the back. He is the originator of Skyline. He's from the University of Washington in Seattle, and you're going you're gonna to work with this tool and learn how to, how to use it. Also, like everything costs money, so I would like to acknowledge financial support for the course from Systems X, which is a Swiss initiative for systems biology, and they have continuously supported this course. So why are we here? Uh, I hope we're here for the right reasons. The, it, it appears that targeting mass spectrometry has increasingly important role in life science research. And one of the goals I try to do for this next 45 to 50 minutes or so is to explain why this, why this is so, because it is still a somewhat unusual way to use mass spectrometry to do measurements on the proteome. Most measurements are done in a different mode, data-dependent mode, or shotgun, or also discovery mode. So tar we, we think that targeting MS is fairly robust and is powerful, um, but many struggle with experimental de design and, ex and data analysis. So that's what we have experienced in our own group, but we also experience that from going to, to meetings. People say, well, it sounds like a great idea, but it's difficult to do. So that was the, the, that was the reason that we said, we, let's try to set up a course and we, 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 um, we would communicate how these steps are being done. So we mostly focus on experimental design, data analysis, and not so much on how to actually run the mass spectrometer, although this will also come up, of course, but not, in, not, not with practical uh, exercises. So this is the goal is, I think, that everyone who is here participating in the course would be able to go home and design a suitable targeting experiments and then to analyze the data when they come out and we assume that there is always access to some form of um, mass spectrometry facility or research group that can actually do the measurements. So this is what I would like to cover in the next um, in this next hour, maybe. And I would also ask you to interrupt. If you have questions, please please ask. You can also, of course, ask questions during the week or, or after, the, after the talk. So why the first point I'd like to cover is why we measure proteins when genomics works so well. And then I go through this, um, through this menu or this outline. So let's start with this first question. Why do we actually worry about proteins? We certainly all know from undergraduate from undergraduate courses, the central dogma of biology, which says that DNA uh, is, is eventually uh, transcribed into transcripts and eventually translate, these are eventually translated into proteins. We also certainly all know that there is enorm has been enormous progress in the genomics world that we can now sequence through an amazingly efficient instrumentation, mRNA and, 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 and DNA extremely efficiently and fast and highly re reliably. So the question would be, why do we need to measure proteins? So uh, the general assumption is that proteins either confirm what has been seen on the on the on, on the on the mRNA level or provides additional information. And I will just show with the two or three examples now very briefly because this is not really the topic of this course that uh, that it is very obvious now that we cannot predict the what happens at the protein level what um, from from the mRNA for a variety of reasons, basically reasons of control. So I now make a few a few comments about this this topic and then we go we go on. So this is from a, this is this is data from a study we did a few years ago together with Jörg Baller from um, from from London, 
And so this, this study was related to or focused on the fission yeast uh, as Pompey. And this is like um, the more, more widely used um, yeast. Cerevisiae is also a single cellular organism and it is, has about 5,000 genes. So what we attempted to do in this organism is to try to quantify as much as we can in terms of absolute numbers, cellular concentrations, the number of proteins and the number of transcripts that it expresses. So this was the study goal. So we took these cells and, and, um, and, and ground them up and Jörg Beller measured as much as, as, as precisely as he could the transcripts and we tried to measure as precisely as we could at the time the proteins. So the results were actually uh, very interesting and to me certainly quite, quite revealing. So the, the, this is data from the transcript level. So the, the, the genes produce very low numbers. Um, the loci produce very low numbers of RNA, mRNA transcripts. And this is a curve of the distribution of transcript numbers. Uh, and you see here, down here, that the number is very, very low. The mean of, uh, the, the median mRNA copies per cell is about, uh, is about two and a half. So this is obviously a very, very low number, and you will, you will, you will immediately see that, or, or conclude that this is in a domain where the cell cannot control on average this number because it is not inconceivable that every cell from a population will have exactly two and a half, um, two, two and a half copies, two and a half is in any way impossible, but uh, let's say three, because it, it would be not conceivable how it, co it controls that. So I think what we're seeing here is that this is relatively, the, the mRNA levels will be, and we know that now from, from other data, is, is kind of once the cell makes a few and then they degrade, so this is an average number which is basically in a stochastic domain. So the total, total number of these mRNAs for the total cell um, from over the whole transcriptome was about 42,000 molecules. So this is also re very cheap uh, when you then come to proteins in terms of energy consumption. So for the cell, it, uh, it's not a very big investment to make these mRNAs and it makes very few and they are then of course translated into proteins. So this is the, the results we arrived uh, at the level of proteins. So first of all, the, the numbers, the mean number is, so this is this curve here, this is a logarithmic scale, so log two, and so the, the mean is, um, is thousands of proteins. And so this is drastically different from the mean of mRNA, uh, M mRNA um, co copies, and what we see here is clearly an enormous efficiency in translating these few mRNAs into, co into copy numbers. So we also see that the, that is much broader the distribution. It goes from very few prote proteins copies per cell to more than a million copies per cell. And if we were to add it all up, it's 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 a it's a very large number, almost 100 million copies per proliferating cell. So these are tiny little cells, and they each contain roughly 100 million uh, proteins. Over, of course, the the whole the distribution of the proteome. So this this would suggest that there is completely different wa ways at at work in terms of regulating this abundance because here the cell can make a few and then it has something, uh, a gene expression, and then, and then they may go away. This is not possible at the protein level because you would have to make put in enormous effort synthetic uh, performance to reach this level. And so I think what the, we, we talk about very different levels of regulation. Here it's more, much more steady, much more filtered, controlled by, a, a different, by different mechanisms than, the, than here the mRNA levels in the stock domain. So this is, this is just to indicate we're really talking about different molecules which are subject to different levels of regulation. And then I have another data set here which is, uh, which is ar arose from a study that we were involved in. It's a small EU project called Phenoxygen. It's now finished. And the, 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 and the question there was how do cells, in this case these were uh, the same type of cells, uh, Pompey cells, how do they react to stress? And the stress we chose in this project was oxidative stress because it's kind of a generic stress and every cell will learn or have evolved to respond to that. So what we did here is we subjected uh, these cells to, to various types of stress, of uh, oxidative stress, and we measured the response uh, over time at the mRNA at the and at the protein level. 
So this is a fairly complicated slide, but I just would like you to convey one, one message related to the question, why do we actually measure proteins? And what, we, what we'd like to show here is that when we clustered, so there were thousands of proteins and, and the corresponding transcripts were measured across, uh, across time courses of, um, of oxidative stress. And then, of course, you can cluster them into groups that behave under these conditions in the same way. And we see here various groups, and these are each one of these groups, or we also refer to these, to these as clusters. We would see um, each one of these will contain a number of genes and uh, corresponding proteins that behave roughly in the same way. And what we see here is various groups. So this, this one, and we see always two curves. One is the transcript curve, the mRNA is the green, and the protein curve is the red. So we see, we see very different behavior at these two levels. For instance, let's just stay up here. We see that the, there's a transcript, transcripts are here, they go away after stress and then they come back and the protein level is low, it goes paradoxically up here when the stress happens, when the mRNA goes away and then slowly decays. So this is, this is one, one pattern and we see very different patterns. This is, for instance, a mRNA pattern which go, dips down after stress and then comes up again and the protein is largely unaffected. We have, of course, also cases like this one here where the mRNA drops and then comes back up and the, and the protein levels also drop with some time delay and then also come slowly back up. But these, these kind of coordinated responses, as you can graphically see here, are largely uh, are, are the large exception. For the most part, the proteins and the, and the mRNA levels are, are happening in a, in a dynamic transition in, in quite different timescales, different dimensions, and even in completely different uh, curves. So this is, this is um, just a few examples that I would like wanted to use at the beginning to just to justify why we worry about proteins. So I think we can by measuring about measuring proteins, we can learn a lot of new biology, which is not apparent from the genomic analysis, even though genomic analysis is very fast and is co of course very powerful. So this, this is the first summary. I will have several summaries, kind of intermediate summaries throughout. This is the first one. Um, we will try to show that protein and proteins and protein modules determine phenotypes. I didn't re not really uh, elaborate on that, but this is, this is on some of the ground bedrock of biological knowledge that we have from undergraduate biology. I showed that transcript profiles do neither predict protein nor protein module profiles, and the transcripts operate in a stochastic domain, very few per, per cell, it's actually also true for humans, and proteins do not. The protein level perturbations, uh, responses to perturbations differ strongly from transcript level to protein responses, not just in the magnitude, but also in the time axis and sometimes even the whole behavior, the whole, um, the, the whole um, graph, uh, the curve, expression curve is different. So far, um, high throughput biology, which uh, a lot of people are doing, has been almost exclusively based on transcript data. And I think the, the course here, the techniques we talk about in the course, are one way to change this and to complement the transcript data or genomic data in general with also, uh, with also accurately measured protein data that are nicely quantitative. So this, I think, is the motivation and is to basically complement, not replace, but complement the, um, the, the DNA world or RNA world with protein data. Okay, so now I would like to make a few general comments about the measurement of proteins and proteomes and then put the targeting MS uh, techniques that we are dealing with without going into technical details. Of course, you will see that throughout the week, but we'll talk about the, how targeting MS fits into the overall proteomic landscape. So when we talk about proteomic analysis, we actually, it's actually a misnomer because we don't really uh, analyze the proteins. So this is a, uh, a graph out of a, a review uh, that um, we wrote a while, a while back, and it kind of summarizes generically what we're going to also discuss in this week. This week. So this is, of course, a protein um, graphically shown, and we don't actually measure this protein. We measure peptides usually derived by trypsinization, but it does not have to be trypsin. But for reasons which you will learn, mostly we use trypsin, or most people use trypsin. Then these peptides are separated by liquid chromatography, 
capillary LC and infused by electrospray ionization into tandem mass spectrometer. And this tandem mass spectrometer has the ability, so there's various types of them, you will get to know them. You will also then get to know those which are most suitable for targeting MS. But targeting MS is not the main method that has been used over the years. For the most part, this, the, the peptides here were analyzed after LC separation ionization by a method called data-dependent analysis or shotgun mass spectrometry, where specific peptides, like this one here, when it diluted from the column was selected as a precursor, fragmented, and then a, a fragment ion spectrum was generated that was then an analyzed through computational tools with respect to, this, to the sequence of this peptide. So this is a very established, well-established workflow and it has evolved over the last 20 years or so into something quite powerful. So we will, um, the, the targeting mass spectrometry has in common with this DDA workflow that we do the same the same uh, steps up front here, we, we also isolate proteins, we also digest them in peptides, we also separate the peptides by chromatography and we also use electrospray ionization. But after the downstream here, we use a different approach. So we don't, we don't, do, uh, we don't try to discover peptides, but we try to find in this haystack of peptides generated a specific or multiple specific peptides we, which we want, to, we want to quantify and we'll learn how to do that. I said that proteomics is actually a misnomer, and I should say for completeness sake that, the, that this general workflow, including what we're discussing and this shotgun mass spectrometry is generally referred to as bottom-up mass spectrometry, where we digest the proteins into peptides. There is a complementary development ongoing. It's actually quite exciting now that people try to measure intact proteins directly in a mass spectrometer, so bypassing this digestion and, um, of, of proteins. So this is referred to as top-down proteomics. We're not talking about that. It has still is facing enormous technical problems, but it is actually an interesting technique now. For a long time, it was more like a, a, a wishful thinking, but now I think it's quite a, a valuable technique. So let's let's follow this. Um, let's follow quickly this path over time and see what has happened. So this technique was developed roughly, this, this shotgun technique was developed in the 90s and then was, was really begun to blossom in the early 2000s. And here this is from a review that we wrote a while back. We, we, we listed some of the uh, important developments in this step, which I don't want to get into, into but I, I think this is an interesting curve to show because I think it also illustrates one justification for targeting mass spectrometry. So here we, we, we read a lot of papers and extracted from, from shotgun mass spectrometry and we extracted the numbers of proteins in that were published in these papers that the authors claimed that they had identified. And so this is a time axis here from about from 1999 till about 2009 when we wrote this. And then these are the number of proteins that were claimed to be identified on logarithmic scale. So we see that the whole thing started relatively modest here. So people in, in the around 2000 claimed maybe a few hundred proteins per to be identified by by uh, by by mass spectrometry from a particular study, and then all of a sudden these numbers skyrocketed to um, to several orders of magnitude higher, so to about um, thousands to almost 10,000 proteins in some studies. So this was this was an, a, an astounding achievement. And then, for some reason, which I'm going to briefly discuss, these numbers went down again. So what this showed, um, uh, what, what, what we have to analyze why, why was this peak. And then uh, I'll comment on the trends back here. But the peak was, what we think now, is, is was due to, to, to essentially to false positives. So here, I think people started to learn how to operate mass spectrometers in a fairly high throughput mode. And then we got adventurous and injected more and more complex samples into mass spectrometer, obtained thousands of spectra, and then run these spectra through some kind of database search engine, identifying presumably thousands of proteins. And then around the time here, our group and other groups started to introduce statistical tools which tried to actually say, is a match of a peptide, a, a, a fragment ion spectrum that's matched to a peptide sequence, is that actually a true match or is it just a match that is actually wrong? 
And so these statistical tools then started to, to basically being used in the community. And this led to a drop in the peptides that were identified. So I think what we, what we see here, this was actually also exactly the same in the transcript array world when, when people started to do CN, CNA, cDNA arrays, um, or transcripts arrays, there were a lot of false positive until really good tools were developed. So that's uh, probably a message also that we will carry forward into the course here because I think what we can claim that is in the targeting mass spectrometry world, the tools right from the beginning were actually quite solid. And I think we will, if we were in 10 years to look back, how, how, uh, were the, how was the credibility of the, of the data from targeting experiments, I would, I would bet that we will not see this peak of false positive identifications, which has to basically be weeded out over time. So if you, are a, if you are a person who likes to use data that are in the literature or in databases, I would be very careful to use any protein data and put a lot of weight on them when they were identified or, or published in, this, in these years. After here, it became very solid. I think we're now on, on solid ground at some level, at least maybe not so much at the level of proteins, but certainly at the level of peptides. So I think what we see here is, is an exuberance of overinterpretation of the data. This was then rectified here and now we see that over the last five to five to six years the number of proteins claimed in a proteomic study have steadily going been steadily going up but not very fast this is actually I think a good sign because it's not obvious why all of a sudden the number of proteins identified should should be um, should explode and we see also that the range of proteins identified in studies with presumably credible data is quite different so the the, the best studies or the most extensive studies now credibly claim maybe in the range of 10,000 proteins identified after a lot of uh, fractionation and, de and detailed analysis, but the average study still is stuck maybe in the range of a few hundreds to a few pro thousand proteins identified. So oftentimes it is stated in, 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 uh, in, as a criticism to targeting proteomics that we cannot, with this technique, identify very, very high numbers of proteins. This is actually not necessarily true anymore, but it is also, I think, it should be, it should be, we should ask also what is the competing technique or the orthogonal technique um, doing, and this, this is also, most studies don't report extremely high numbers of proteins. So this is one aspect I wanted to show, and then the other aspects, which I think is easy, is, is interesting to pursue, is to ask, okay, we are now able to, in, in this decade of the, let's say from the mid 2000s on, onwards, so this is after all about 10 years, we are now in a position to really identify quite large numbers of proteins quite credibly. And we can ask then again, how has this information use, been used to transform the biological landscape. This is again um, an ana analysis, meta-analysis of the literature, and this was not done by us, but it was done by Al Edwards, who tends to do really interesting and innovative, uh, ask interesting and innovative questions. So here he asked the question that if we now, in, in about the year 2000, the genome was announced, and we could, we could know in principle now most pro or the proteins that are, can be produced by the human genome. I mean, just by, by computational tools, but as I just showed, also increasingly experimentally. So these proteins are accessible in principle, are measurable for the most part. I come back to some limits just in a second. But so, so Al basically used, again, read a lot of papers, and he asked, uh, he basically computed an impact factor of proteins. So he basically asked, how often has a, protein, a specific protein been showing up in the literature as, as in, in a biological paper? And so he plotted this, this here, and he did this actually for the whole proteome, but I just show a graph here from his paper that's related to protein kinases. So here we have about 500 protein kinases, so he lists here 450 of those, and this is basically the impact factor. Um, uh, this, this down here is basically the impact factor of this protein um, of these proteins, uh, these protein kinases. So we see uh, we see that there is, let's first look at the blue curve here, we see that there is relatively few of these protein kinases that have a lot of citations and, very, and most of them have none or very low numbers. So then he did this analysis before the genome was, was announced or, or described and after. So the blue is 10 years before the genome was um, an announced and then 
the, the, the red one here is the time from uh, the genome announcement to 2009. So this is where, in principle, one knew all these proteins. And, and to some extent, one could also measure them by, through the DDA methods. And we see that the curve has not really changed. There's still a few, actually the same protein kinases, which were mostly studied after genome announcement and these really astounding developments in proteomics. There's a few that came up here, and these are probably, these, the, they were now all of a sudden quite widely cited, and it turns out that this has nothing to do with proteomics. This, is, this has to do with the fact that someone developed an antibody against these proteins, these particular kinases. This antibody was, 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 uh, could be commercially obtained, and then people start, started to study the protein. So what Al concluded here, or we have to ask two questions, why has genomics not impacted more strongly the segment of the proteome? that is re being reported in these papers, and I just mentioned a, a, a survey of protein kinase, but this is also applies to essentially any other protein. And the other question is, why has proteomics not impacted more strongly the segment of the protein that is being reported in these papers? So there's been these two enormously powerful genomic and proteomic developments over the last 20 years or so, culminating in enormously powerful technical achievements, but it has had very little influence on the the segment of the proteome that is actually showing up in biological studies as um, as, uh, as as proteins that have been that are being studied in from a functional or biochemical level. So the conclusion was from Al Edwards' paper, and I think this is a very very credible conclusion that new findings are reported predominantly on those proteins that are routinely measurable in many laboratories. That is, those for which antibodies are available. So this is the conclusion, and we, if, one, if one goes a step further from, in this, from this uh, conclusion, one would say that if we really want to achieve from a proteomic point of view that a larger fraction of the proteome is being measurable and routinely measurable and shows up actually in the scientific literature, then we need to make a larger fraction of uh, ideally the whole proteome uh, measurable r r routinely and in many laboratories, not just in two or three highly specialized proteomic laboratories. And we think that this is justification for developing these targeting mass spec methods because they really do allow uh, many laboratories, if with, with relatively moderate investment, to make a very large fraction of the proteome measurable and highly reliably and reproducibly measurable. So why would we not just rely on, on antibodies um, and say, well, let's just, um, let's just use antibodies to do these measurements uh, as has been in the past routine. And the reason is that antibodies have their own problems, which I don't want to discuss here, but for the, the even bigger reason is that for most proteins someone wants to study, there simply is not a credible antibody. And that may, that may be changing in the case of human, but if you work with mice or rats or, or yeast, there is virtually no antibodies available that, that one can buy. So I think if one were to wait till experimentation can be done by antibodies, one would have to wait quite a long time. And what we, what we learned this week is that if we do these measurements with proteomic techniques, it can go very fast to generate the suitable measurement capabilities, basically the, make them routinely measurable. Uh, this is relatively straightforward. So I think in summary of this, we have a, a somewhat interesting situation that if we make here a plot, um, a schematic plot of proteins that we would like to measure over many conditions, which was many, many, um, many uh, biologists like to do, and these conditions could be clinical cohorts, it could be perturbation series, it could be time series, dosage series, or, or whatever conditions one, one might think of, then we are right now, I think, in the position mostly that we can either use these proteomic techniques which go very deep to discover a proteome, but they don't do it very well on large numbers of fractions. This is the shotgun or discovery method. Or we can use antibody or traditionally have been using antibody related techniques to, to, sec to measure over many conditions relatively few proteins for which antibodies were available. That's the conclusion from Al Edwards' paper. And what, what we are trying to achieve with mass spectrometry, targeted mass spectrometry, is to basically make this whole box here here, measurable highly reliably, so that virtually any protein in this box could be measured in, in quantified and at high reproducibility. I think this is the objective, and it's, it's, it is a way to, to make um, protein measurements more routine 
more reproducible, easy, more easily accessible. So this is some this is a summary. Second summary here: There's broad consensus that protein and protein analysis are critical for critical for life science research. Um, this is clearly also reflected in the high number of research papers that come out based focused on proteins. And there's basically two communities have been emerging. One to study proteins, uh, to proteins and proteomes. They do have not been converging. One is the Western blood community. These are cell biologists and biochemists, which publish most of the papers using of antibody-based analysis. And the proteomics community, which has focused mostly on identifying from a sample a very large inventory of proteins. And we, what we are trying to achieve here with this targeting MS is to kind of convert these two, uh, these two communities. Okay, so now I'd like to put targeting MS into the context of the proteomics landscape. I already said, we already seen that, uh, and I already said that what we're talking about here is from the upstream the sample preparation exactly the same as you might have been used to in DDA uh, or shotgun mass spectrometry. The only difference is how we acquire data here and how we analyze the data subsequently. But we can use essentially the same samples to uh, do targeted mass spectrometry or, or, um, or discovery mass spectrometry. So again, a few years back, we wrote a review or some kind of a commentary and we, we proposed that uh, basically following Al Edwards' argument that to make proteins measurable, one would need to have some kind of assay or, or ability to measure these proteins routinely. So we, we postulated at the time or, or, or suggested that one would basically separate the proteomics efforts into two branches. The one would be a discovery uh, or a discovery branch where one would attempt to discover um, the whole proteome by mass spectrometry using the DDA method. So this would, is discovery proteomics and we would like to generate basically fragment ion spectra reflecting or indicating most or all of the proteins that a, a species can produce. And then rather than doing this perpetually and always rediscovering the proteome, we suggested that we would then use these complete maps, these proteome maps, to learn new biology by using targeted mass spectrometry. So basically use these spectra generated that indicate really truly the presence and, and identify a peptide. It's like a fingerprint for a person. A fragment line spectrum is like a fingerprint for a peptide. It truly identifies this peptide if it is a good, if it is a good, if it is a good fragment line spectrum. That once we would ge generate them once and then we would we would use these spectra to, to drive or instruct subsequent measurements by targeting. So this first part here has been exceedingly successful. Um, this is uh, data from the Peptide Atlas project at the ISB in Seattle. This is, uh, I got this data from Eric Deutsch. And, and he, he shows, he basically does in this project, he collects the data, fragment ion spectra that are being generated by many hundreds of researchers around the world. He runs them, this, this spectra, through a, through a consistent data analysis pipeline and he assigns to these fragment ion spectra peptide sequences. There's other sites that do similar things, um, but this is just the data that, um, that Eric um, provided. So this is the, again a time axis and here we see the, the amount of data collected and the number of spectra searched and the number of proteins and peptides identified from the spectra. So these numbers are quite astounding. So first we see an extremely strong growth here and we see that uh, hundreds of millions of fragment ion spectra have been generated by, by scientists and have actually been donated for this effort. So Eric then concludes that these millions of spectra contain or represent about, a, about one million distinct peptides. This is all for the human proteome and similar things can be done for, um, for, for other species, of course. And that they represent about 14,000 14, to 14,200 um, uh, proteins, canonical proteins. That means from basically uh, products from specific loci. So this is, this is a strong growth curve here of this number of spectra generated and we could say, well, maybe we're almost there with the, with the 20,000 ORFs, but we're not. So then we, because we can now look how, was this, how does, what happens if we add, if we keep adding to this already 
a very large amount of spectra, hundreds of millions of spectra, um, if we add another few million. And the, the results are actually interesting. What, what it shows here is, is that in 2013, there were a certain number about, uh, of, of peptide spectrum matches, about, let's say, half a million. And then a number of very large data sets were, were published. Two of them were now quite famous and also controversial papers from Akhilesh Pandya and Bernard Küster, which added a fair amount of additional peptides. Um, and also very large number of spectra. Now, when we, when we translate this increase in, spect in peptide identified into proteins identified, we see that there is virtually no increase. So what it basically means is that if someone now is going out and, ha and takes a, a particular human sample, um, and they will sequence with a shotgun machine through this sample, and they may even identify some additional peptides which no one has seen before, but it seems that the number of proteins that were identified or represented by all these peptides that we know so far is roughly capping out at about 14,500. So you will, if those who follow the literature will see that some of these individual papers actually claimed quite, high, um, uh, quite considerably higher numbers of proteins identified from their data set alone. And now this, this has been over the last year discussed very, very extensively in the business and what the conclusion was that individual papers and data sets tended to overestimate the number of proteins represented by this data and that, the, that there is basically a propagation of false positive protein identifications from absolutely correctly identified uh, peptide identifications. This is, a comp this is a complicated argument but we've seen that very early on in the peptide atlas and with the consensus is the take-home message that right now for about 14,500 of the presumably about 20,000 proteins of human origin, we have actually credible evidence in terms of reference spectra and, and, the, and the associated peptide sequences that these peptides have been discovered and the corresponding proteins have been discovered. For the other proteins, we don't actually know why they have not been discoverable because they may be difficult to solubilize Maybe they, they don't exist, or maybe they, they have not been found because the right samples have not been analyzed. But so for, for about uh, 14 and a half thousand or so proteins, there are uh, credible data with corresponding reference spectra, which we can now use for targeting, um, for, for targeting um, purposes. So this, this summary would be, this now actually three, I misname, mislabeled this. That the discovery of the proteome by LCMSMS has been highly successful. I think we reached saturation, uh, we reached roughly saturation coverage of the proteome discoverable with this with this method. And if someone wants to discover additionally large numbers of new proteins from these roughly 5,000 proteins which should be there but have not been seen, one might want to do something different than just grind up another human tissue or cell line and shoot it into the mass spectrometer. And the current coverage, this is fairly good consensus from a variety of sources, is about 14 and a half thousand ORFs. Um, what I think would also say is that the new biology learned from these lists of proteins has been relatively moderate. It's great to know that the protein exists, it's, that it's expressed in a certain tissue, but it uh, doesn't tell us a lot, a lot of functional uh, information. And uh, we think, going back to Al Edwards's case, our argument, that we learn new biology when we can use these proteins here and do repeat measurements, basically make them generally measurable in many different biological contexts. So this is the first part here of the proteomic landscape, the discovery proteome, and I think I, ref I kind of indicate the current status, where many people would agree that this is roughly the current status. And then we would like to co use these complete proteome maps to learn new biology, and we think this can be done by targeted mass spectrometry. So this is the, this is the, 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 this, the objective of, of uh, discovering the proteome, we try to go as deep as possible. Now we reached here about 14 and a half thousand ORFs. And from to learn biology, we would, we would need to measure these proteins, ideally all of those, but at least some fraction of those highly reproducibly across many conditions. And the reason that this is so difficult is 
that the proteome is highly complex. So I would like to remind you that these 14 and a half thousand proteins roughly that have been identified credibly now, um, where most people would agree that they have been credibly identified, is the result of tens of thousands of LCMS MS runs. It simply is inconceivable that one would do this for many samples over and over again and spend this enormous effort. And we need to reach this to, 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 a to do a large effort to discover most of the proteome because the number of peptides that are generated by digesting a complex proteome is very high. So here I list from about um, 10 to 100 million peptides, but we don't actually know whether this is true. Uh, we don't, no one knows how many peptides are being generated from digesting a proteome. We can extrapolate and then we end up with numbers like this. And one of the extrapolation comes from data that Paola Picotti uh, generated uh, quite a long time ago. She came once here and was a visit, as a visiting PhD student. And I thought, uh, I, th I was thinking about some, something like a, a, a confined project for her to do. And the project we came up with was to say, why don't you take a, a highly purified protein or a number of highly purified proteins as, as pure as we can and digest them with trypsin and simply ask how many peptides and which peptides are, are, can a mass spectrometer discover from a tryptic digest of a highly purified protein. And the results were actually quite astounding. So this is what, what she found. She took a very a relatively small protein, lactoglobulin, doesn't matter really what it is because the, the conclusion is the same for essentially any protein. And she digested it with trypsin. And then she measured uh, with the best mass spectrometer we had available at the time, which peptides would she could identify that are from this protein. So if one were to, to, see, to take this sequence of about 140 amino acids and use, run it through an algorithm that predicts tryptic peptides, one would end up with roughly 20. But what she found is, is, is uh, more than 100 peptides and probably with, if one did this again today with a, with a better instrument, one would probably find uh, additional peptides which are at low level. So, so these are the peptides she found. So there were some which have uh, uh, unspecific cleavage, there were some, um, there were some truncations. Uh, basically these are the cleavage sites where one would expect cleavage and then we see a lot of peptides which, which, which are redundant. Uh, in the sense that they cover the same region of the protein. And we see uh, basically a large number of peptides emerging, some of which conform to tryptic cleavage and some of which do not. So if she plots that, if we plot that in a different way, we see that this is the number of peptides is covered n. This is the relative intensity, the signal intensity detected by the mass spectrometer. We see there's a few peptides that have a that cover a large ion current, so they have relatively high intensity in terms of signals. These are typically fully tryptic peptides. And we see a large, large tail here of peptides which are only partially tryptic, but still derived from this digestion from this protein. So they're real peptides. And they and they drag out here for into the hundred uh, hundreds of peptides. Now you could say, well, I don't really care about these guys here because compared to these, there's a very low ion current. So why would I care? This is basically noise. But this but this is this would be true if proteins were uh, expressed in the cell roughly at equimolar levels. But we know that this is not so. We know that the highest levels of proteins are expressed in a human cell in the, in the, in, at, at ten, a few tens of millions of copies, let's say 20, 30 million copies per cell, and the lowest proteins are present probably in a few copies or maybe a, hun a few hundred copies. So the consequence is, if we, if we generate all this proteolytic uh, background here, uh, from, from highly expressed proteins, then we, this, these peptides, even though they have an ion current of maybe only 1% of the highest, highest ex detectable peptides from these corresponding proteins, uh, compared to a protein that's expressed at five or six orders of magnitude lower, this is still gigantic signals. And that's exactly what we see when we run a, uh, a, a digest of a complex proteome through a mass spectrometer. We see a lot of this background noise. These are peptides which are genuine. They're even reproducibly generated, but they they don't really add a lot of new information because once we know, for instance, once we have measured this region here with this peptide, just to take an example, there's no need that we measure all these other peptides which basically cover the same, the same area. 
So um, this the, a consequence of this um, of this proteolytic background, which actually at the time when we when Paolo generated this data was highly contested whether this was true. I think now most people would agree that this is actually the case and complicates the analysis of proteomes. One consequence is that if we take a, a mass spect um, a, a mass spectrum mass spectrometer to analyze a proteome. So here we see retention time versus mass. We'll see lots of these plots, I think, throughout the week. And we color code the peptides detectable by this mass spectrometer. And those which are identified by the mass spectrometer in DDA mode, we see that it has great difficulty to get complete coverage. So here we see black dots are peptides detectable by the mass spectrometer. Blue ones are those where the mass spectrometer selects for fragmentation, and the red ones are those which are presumably correctly identified. So this doesn't look so bad here, but when we blow up a, a region or zoom into a region which is busy, we see that it actually doesn't look so good. So there's uh, many more black features than, than blue or red features, and not all the blue features are also red. That means there's many peptides here, precursors, genuine precursors that are detectable by the instrument, and then but, and some of them are, are selected for fragmentation, but not all lead to a positive identification. I think many of these, ma many of these peptides may be, may be proteolytic background noise, but the, the upshot is that the number of features in this, in this graph here, retention time versus precursor mass, is very large. We don't know how many these are, but certainly there's many more than the mass spectrometer has sequencing cycles available in the available chromatographic time, and that leads to this undersampling, and the undersampling leads to irreproducible data when we reanalyze the same sample over, over multiple times. So the mass spectrometry in every reanalysis will identify a reasonably high number of peptides, but it will not do this necessarily, the, will not necessarily re-identify uh, re the same peptides from the same sample. And so it makes these comparisons of proteomic data sets across multiple samples quite difficult. And, and what we try to achieve, I think one of the biggest achievements of the targeted strategy is that it eliminates largely, not completely, but it eliminates largely these white dots so we can actually take multiple samples and do meaningful comparisons where, the data, where we can generate essentially complete data sets of N proteins versus N uh, conditions. Okay, so this is summary three. Um, what I try to show here, try to, or, to place the targeting mass spectrometry in the general proteomic landscape of today. We showed that the discovery of proteomes by LCMSMS has been very successful. I think we reached essentially saturation for the human proteome, also for other proteomes. The question how we can find and detect the, the missing proteins is actually an interesting one. And there is, there is a lot of discussions at, at places, for instance, like Hoopo. Um, but, um, but, but so this is not the, the purpose of the discussion here. The proteome is very complex, and even the fastest instrument cannot sequence every peptide in a, every sample. This is in stark contrast to the situation with next generation sequencing, which is so massively parallel that when someone does a transcript profile, we can be fairly sure that there is every transcript has been is, is measured maybe multiple times over. There they did such a parallel technique that the throughput is fast enough that we know we cover everything that's there to be seen. In proteomics, we're not at this point, and so we believe that to obtain reproducible data sets you have to make a compromise between reproducibility and numbers of peptides identified and towards to the, towards robustness and the targeting MS supports the uh, puts weight on the reproducibility maybe at the cost of the number of the peptides identified. So now I'm going to go here and say would like to make two or three cases why the information in targeting data sets is useful. So um, we'll see how we do with time. I just, I just start here uh, with the first point. First, I want to discuss why is reproducibility actually important. So it's great to discover a large number of proteins, but most experimenters who are sitting in a biological laboratory would say a key of reproducible me or key of experimentation is reproducible measurement. Reproducible 
reproducibility is the bedrock of requirement, bedrock requirement of experimental science. You will oftentimes be asked by reviewers to do three, three replicates of a measurement. Interestingly enough, in, in early in genomics, but also in proteomics, this was usually dismissed. And if you read through the proteomic literature, there's actually still, I would say, the majority of papers will, will not have repeat analysis. They basically say it's too expensive to do this three times. We already know from one analysis that we're doing roughly right. But in most other experimentation, experimental biology, reproduci reproducibility is important. Clinical or biomarker studies depend on the comparison of multiple samples. There's simply no way one can find a biomarker in one or two examples. One needs large cohorts to deal with the normal variation in the human population. So there, clearly, reproducibility is, 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 is of, as a prime in interest. And also, systems biology studies depend on the correlative analysis of multiple data sets. This is like the big data science, and there again, one needs to have highly reproducible data. I would like to also point out that the issue of reproducibility in biological science is an extremely touchy and actually uh, dangerous um, uh, uh, field. So there has been, many of you may follow this, but there is now a number of studies published where which show where people have taken literature values, basically report, re results reported in the literature, and said, okay, let's reproduce it. We take the information, the cell lines, the drugs, the exact conditions from a paper, and we try to reproduce a study as it has been done in the literature. And the results of reproducibility have been abysmal. So there's a number of papers that have been out. There's now a, a, a quickly growing list. But the, but the conclusion is that very few, uh, actually the minority of studies of published results is actually reproducible. So this should worry us, of course. Of course, most people now say, well, this is in clinical research, which is messy anyway. But I think that's not true. I think this, is, this goes over all fields, and I think one of the reasons why why this? Why we we're, we're talking about reproducibility in mass spectrometry? That the data, if the data collection is already has a problem, of course the conclusions will be dirty. And so, it, so I think there should be an emphasis on having reproducible data achievable across multiple laboratories. The dangerous part of this argument is that politicians who are generally science averse anyway, and there's some of those, of course, in every country, they can simply go and say. The money that is invested into science is largely wasted. I mean, this would be a, a very simple conclusion, say, the US government spends about 30 billion for funding of NIH. If only 10% of the data is actually usable, 27 or so billion is, is, is flushed down the drain. A very simplistic explanation, of course, but a dangerous one, and I think we should worry about that. So, we, so a, a little contribution to this situation might be to make the entry data that's entered these studies somewhat reproducible. So, the, so we undertook a study just to show that targeting MS can actually be, or, or we wanted to test whether targeted MS can provide reproducible data across laboratories, as Al Edwards would also postulate is, rec is necessary to expand the breadth of experimentation of proteins. And the study here is done, is one that's actually done by Ben Collins in collaboration with many other laboratories. And we, we basically wanted to uh, do a cross-lab reproducibility study of targeting mass spectrometry. And the, and, the, and the flavor of targeting mass spectrometry you'll get to know is a relatively highly pa parallel form of, of targeting. Uh, we, we call swath mass spectrometry. It's also running under the term data independent analysis. But the details are not really here how this is done, be measured, but I want to show now how, what the data, what the study tries to attempt, and some the results that we, uh, we think we can achieve. The study was the following. We take a complex background, which is a cell isolate of, um, of a human cell line. It doesn't really matter but it's which one, but it's HEC293. Um, we lysed these cells basically as one would normally do and make peptides out of these cells by digesting the proteins. And then into this sample, a variety of, uh, of standard peptides, isotope labeled peptides, were mixed into this, into this complex background. So isotope labeled peptides, of course, are detectable then by their mass shift in the mass spectrometer. 
and we they can be quantified. And Ben came up with a schema where these peptides were diluted in, in clever ways so that a, a, um, that a whole, a, a very wide dynamic range is, is, um, is covered overall and the and participating laboratories in this study, if this, this cross-study cross laboratories were uh, asked to run this dilution series, basically a set of samples, in a schema uh, throughout a week in the laboratory to accumulate um, about 20, I think it's 27 runs per um, analysis per, per laboratory in a week and this was done in 10 labs. So we basically generate a fairly high number of, um, of repeat analysis in between laboratories, in within the laboratory and across laboratories where the, um, where we could see how many proteins can be identified or quantified in the lysate and how do these dilution series of, of which we know of course how they should perform because that's how the, the peptides were diluted into the sample could be performed namely how these dilution series could be recalled from the data. So this is the uh, this is the, the outline. So we recruited uh, or got the agreement of, um, of uh, a total of 11 laboratories. It's not important who they are. And they agreed to do this and they would run this, let's say on Monday, on Wednesday, and on Friday of a week, they would run these samples in a particular order and everyone would do the same. And then send the data back here to, to Ben. And the questions we wanted to ask is, can, do we detect a consistent set of proteins across laboratories? So this is basically a proteomic question to ask, can we detect and also quantify proteins here that, the same, that are roughly the same as has been seen, for instance, in a lab in the US or in China? And the other qu question was, what are the quantitative characteristics across laboratories? And for that, we can use the dilution series of peptides spiked in. So these are some early analysis, which actually look very promising. And this will probably still slightly change, but I think we're, we're converging on a, on a fairly final, um, final uh, list of, of, of proteins and numbers. So here would be the different sites. Each site carried out um, this set of analysis and reported the data back. So this is a total of more than 200 analysis of these same samples. And we simply ask which proteins were, by targeting the proteins in these samples, we, how reproducibly were proteins detectable and, and how many proteins were detectable. And do these laboratories see roughly the same, num the same proteins, not just the same numbers? So this is encouraging because everyone sees not identical numbers but quite similar numbers and they're quite high. So more than 4,000 proteins we think are, are detectable across um, these labs. And here is a accumulation plot which shows basically the accumulation of proteins that would be seen across these laboratories. So if, if everyone was seeing different sets of proteins, this curve would be going up, but it's not. So it's basically stable and that means that the proteins here, this, this group did very well in terms of proteins identified, was also internally very reproducible through, du during their samples, but the numbers of proteins they saw do not really contribute a lot to what has been seen up to here, that means they see a bit more than, for instance, that laboratory, but they, they see the same, the same proteins, not, not just the same number, but the same proteins that cumulatively has been seen by the other laboratories. This is extremely encouraging, and, um, and I think it, it shows that targeting MS can actually make headway into generating um, reproducible data sets. Then we also ask now the dilution of these peptides uh, that were the isotopically labeled peptides. The, these are the 30 peptides that are in the matrix uh, spiked in uh, across about six orders of magnitude concentration. And this slide basically shows the, these various um, peptides at various concentrations. And each dot here is a lab. And of course, they have somewhat different response, but we see that basically they are on a linear curve. And uh, we have good linearity across the laboratories for about Five, four and a half orders of magnitude uh, linear dynamic range. We can also ask, um, um, so I'm skipping over a lot of uh, things that have to do with how these values are calculated and how, how the, the data are normalized, but, but basically if we do dilution series of specific peptides, we see that the different laboratories 
are actually doing quite well and that they, they come up with fairly similar concentration dilution series that are parallel, that are relatively similar to each other and that they span approximately the, the same um, dynamic range across the measurable rate. Uh, I think I want to make a comment here also that this is, this is the data again shown of, of which basically reflects the detection rate of peptides as a function of concentration. This is with targeting mass spectrometry using MS2 level information, could be SRM, but we use this DIA method, which you get to know in detail. So the labs again do quite well in terms of reproducibility between laboratories. And these are similar, these are the data which were also extracted from the same, same data sets where the peptides were quantified by their MS1 level. So the precursor ion intensity, and we can see that it is more spread out. It's exactly Exactly the same data set, so it is not doing reinjections. But we see that the uh, MS1 level information, where the precursor ions are sought after in the in this in the mass spectra and quantified, of, of these of these dilution peptides, we see that first of all the, the curves are more diverse, and they're also shifted over to the higher end by approximately an order of magnitude. So it clearly shows that the um, if one is using, like we do in targeting mass spectrometry as we discuss it, the fragment ion information we see deeper down into the proteome more reliably and more consistently within a laboratory but also across laboratories than if we use MS1 information for the same purpose. So this is the summary for we, um, the, this is encouraging from the point of view of using this technique compellingly as a reproducible technique within a laboratory across data, but also across laboratories. So everyone detected from these 11 labs about 4,000 proteins in and quantified them uh, with quite high reproducibility. The accumulation of new proteins is very low, so this that means it's consistent. The targeting performance is linear dynamic range of about four and a half orders of magnitude. They reach um, range, detection range in the mid-atomal level to low femtomal, also depends a bit on the peptide. And the average CVs with, with, within sites was 10 to 15 percent, and the average CVs across sites I think is about currently now about 20 percent. So uh, this is actually encouraging from in the backdrop of, of reproducible experimentation. Um, so the maybe I go another maybe three, four minutes and then, then I stop. But I think we would also like to make a point that this targeting MS is not just useful to make, um, ha to make the data more reproducible um, and consistent, but also to detect, um, to detect, to increase specificity of detecting specific analytes, and I like to illustrate this, basically to provide inf additional information that's not easily obtainable um, in mass spectrometry by mass spectrometry in other ways. So um, I'm using an example of um, protein phosphorylation analysis. So. This is again a time course uh, of phosphopeptides identified over time. It's from a review from Albert Tech, who has been very, very active and successful in this field of phosphopeptide analysis. And it, and it shows again that we see now an explosion of phosphorylation sites identified. Phosphorylation sites, of course, are interesting because they, they we assume that protein phosphorylation is important for regulatory purposes in biological systems. So these numbers are even higher now, they're in the range of probably now 10, 20, 30 or even 50,000 peptides. So the study goal was to quantify specific phosphopeptide isoforms in the presence of specific kinase inhibitors, so this is not what I really want to stress, the biological background, but we wanted to see whether we can use um, targeted mass spectrometers mass spectrometry to reduce the uh, or to increase the confidence of identifying phospho phosphorylated peptides. So with phosphorylated peptides the problem is twofold. The one is we need to identify the right backbone and we need to also identify the right site where the phosphate group is attached. Identifying the backbone is there is very good tools and I think the error rate there is quite low identifying the site of attachment 
is still a very tricky issue. And that's where we, where we wanted to test whether we use targeted mass spectrometry, whether we could reduce the uh, rate of wrong uh, site assignments. So the study was basically to generate a number of, um, of samples in a, in a particular biological context. It's always the cell, cell, same cell line, but under different conditions. They were analyzed in quadruplicate, and the person who did most of this work is Alessio Maiolico, who is no longer here, but um, he did the study. And then he did what everyone is doing in this business. He generated samples from these cell lines. He ran them through a data-dependent analysis, DIA mass spectrometer. He used state-of-the-art tools to identify the phosphopeptides contained in these samples. And he ended up with about um, uh, close to 20,000 uh, unique phosphopeptides that he identified in, the, in, in this study. So this is a roughly state-of-the-art study. Some people who do more, um, more fractionation will get maybe larger numbers. But this is, um, this is, quite, this is quite reasonable. And then he, he, he made the following plots. So these are now the samples here. So they have names we don't need to worry about. We just call them from 1 to 24. And here on the y-axis is the number of phosphopeptides identified in each one of these samples. So we see here that he identified roughly uh, five to 6,000 phosphopeptides in per sample. And then when we plotted them, this is accumulation plot here, which I showed also in the cross-lab study, we see it's, it's continuously and steadily rising. So this is this actually made us slightly nervous because we could we, why would why would we if we sequence peptides from these samples here why would we all of a sudden continuously discover new peptides new new phosphorylated peptides so we then uh, this is also the work from um, from most of the data analysis was actually done by Ludovic Schie who who you might also encounter in, during this week. And he then also plotted or suggested that we also plot the backbone sequences. Now we strip the phosphate on and ask how many, how many backbone sequences are represented in the phosphopeptides identified from the samples. So these are the red numbers here, and we see that there is a certain number. It's also quite, quite reasonable numbers. But when we do an accumulation plot, uh, it basically stabilizes out. At least it does not rise as much. So this is a, this was alarming to us because we thought, what if? How do we actually know? This is what we would observe, what we expect from such a sample, and it eventually caps out. We have discovered what there is to be discovered, and this keeps steadily rising. So the hypothesis was that this would be a, that much of this delta here would be a propagation of false phosphopeptide assignments, not of, not false background se backbone sequences. But when the machine would put the computer program would put the phosphocyte at the wrong sites, and there's many reasons why this can happen, and we analyzed this, and I don't have time to discuss it. But let's just say this is the hypothesis, and now we we wanted to ask if we if we use targeted mass spectrometry, can we actually separate Separate these peptides. Can we false this false propagation for propagation of false phosphocytes? Can we discriminate that from truly assigned uh, phosphocytes? So the um, to illustrate what I'm talking about, I take some data that Tina that Tina generated a while back, and she analyzed phosphorylation phosphopeptides that are have the same backbone sequence, but the phosphate is attached to different phosphorylation site. So, so when we fragment these peptides in a mass spectrometer by data-dependent analysis, we generate a number of B and Y ions, which are named here, and we, we color-coded, or Tina color-coded color these fragment ions in red if they are shared between these three peptides, or if they're unique to one of these three peptides. So again, the peptide has the same backbone, but the site of phosphorylation is different. So we, you will see immediately, without going into a lot of detail, that most of these fragment ions are red, that means they're shared between the peptides. If we take these fragment ions now and, sh and shoot them through a database search engine, it will have great difficulty to distinguish these forms simply on the peptide spectra alone, because there's simply very few fragment ions that are uniquely identifying the peptides. So it's not an issue of the search tools not being good, it's an issue of the information not being present. So what Tina then did is she synthesized these peptides in heavy form and run them through a targeting mass spectrometer and where we also have the um, 
where we also have the uh, retention time information of each one of these peptides because we can see how the specific fragment ions elude over chromatographic time in a targeting mass spec experiment. Each one generate of these peptides generate very nice transition signals. You will know how to actually interpret those. But the important message is if these three peptides, which are largely indistinguishable by their spectra alone, fragment ion spectra alone, are run together we can and we target each one of those in the in the sample, we see that the peaks are nicely separated. So we basically what we're saying is we believe that fragment ion that the retention time information is that we can capture exclusively by targeting mass spectrometry that pro this provides an additional data dimension that allows us to separate generally, I'm not saying this happens every time, but in, in the mass, vast majority of cases, allows us to separate peptides apart, which have the same backbone, have the same mass, but have some other difference, let's say the different attachment site of a modification. The beautiful here, because the 72 peptide eludes here, baseline separated, the S70 peptide follows and S75 peptide follows, are basically separated and can clearly be distinguished. So we wanted to do this, see whether this also, whether one could scale this up to larger targeting experiment and generalize this. So Alessio generated a reference spectral library from these phosphopeptides extracted from these samples. And he made a phosphopeptide library that had in excess of 10,000 phosphopeptides that were actually in the library. And then he used targeted mass spectrometry <coughs> to reanalyze exactly the same samples. So that's it's where this was we, where we were before. This was the DDA data where we have 24 samples, certain number of phosphopeptides identified, certain number of backbone peptides identified. The phosphopeptides creep up, the, the backbone peptides eventually start to saturate. And now we show the data from the targeted analysis. We see also we see a certain number of, of, of phosphopeptides, the green ones, which actually is quite high. And then the interesting thing is that the accumulation plot follows precisely the accumulation plot of the backbone sequences. And we think that what this indicates is that by, by adding this added retention time information to separate peptides, phosphopeptides which have the same backbone, but a different phosphocyte attachment, largely eliminates this creep of false positives. So we think that this is, this is a very good indication although we don't, of course, know for every case because it's hard to go through thousands of peptides and make a manual assessment, or this is kind of a, a data-driven assessment. But we think this is promising that the creep, or the creeping up here of identified fossil peptides is, is reduced and follows largely the number of backbone sequences. And we think that is a true phosphopeptide identifications. And, and the, that by adding the added retention time, we don't just add, um, we, we have additional res resolving power, so to speak, to say that the assignment of phosphorylated peptides, phosphocytes to a peptide, can be done more confidently than it could in the past. The summary five here is that phosphopeptide, quantif phosphopeptide quantification across sample cohorts by, by targeting MS requires a time, time to build a suitable spectral library. You will learn how to do this. It identifies larger number of peptides per run. It uses FDR creep due to erroneous site assignment and it creates reproducible quantitative data sets also at the level of modifications. So now I was already a bit long, so I'm basically finished here and uh, thank you for your attention. I wish you have an interesting course and a, and a generally pleasant week uh, here in, in Zurich and, and I'm, I'm convinced that you will learn a lot because the uh, instructors have put a lot of effort in preparing the course and I think it will also be fun. So thank you for your attention and um, uh, I'll also be around if someone wants to ask something.